taking responsibility and having the willingness to discipline yourself to accept personal responsibility for your life is essential for happiness, health, success, achievement, and personal leadership. Accepting responsibility is one of the hardest of all disciplines, but without it, no success is possible. The failure to accept responsibility and the attempt to hoist responsibility for things in your life that make you unhappy onto other people, institutions, and situations completely distorts cause and effect, undermines your character, weakens your resolve, and diminishes your humanity. It leads to making endless excuses. My great revelation came when I was 21. I was living in a tiny apartment and working as a construction laborer. I had to get up at 5 a.m. to take three buses to work in order to be there by 8 a.m. I didn't get home until 7 p.m., tired out from carrying construction materials all day. I was making just enough money to get by, and I had no car, almost no savings, and just enough clothes for my needs. I had no radio or television. It was in the middle of a cold winter, with a temperature at minus 35 degrees Fahrenheit, so I seldom went out in the evening. Instead, if I had enough energy, I sat in my small apartment at my little table in my kitchen nook and read. One evening, late at night, as I was sitting there by myself at the table, it suddenly dawned on me that this is my life. This life was not a rehearsal for something else. The game was on, and I was the main character, as in a play. It was like a flashbulb going off in my face. I looked at myself and around me at my small apartment, and I considered the fact that I had not graduated from high school. The only work that I was qualified to do was manual labor. I earned just enough money to pay my basic expenses, and I had very little left over at the end of the month. I suddenly knew that unless I change, nothing else was going to change. No one else was going to do it for me. In reality, no one else really cared. I realized at that moment that from that day forward, I was completely responsible for my life and for everything that happened to me. I was responsible. I could no longer blame my situation on my difficult childhood or mistakes I had made in the past. I was in charge. I was in the driver's seat. This was my life, and if I didn't do something to change it, it would go on like this indefinitely by the simple force of inertia. This revelation changed my life. I was never the same again. From that moment on, I accepted more and more responsibility for everything in my life. I accepted responsibility for doing my job better than before, rather than doing only the minimum that was necessary to avoid getting fired. I accepted responsibility for my finances, my health, and especially my future. The very next day, I went down to a local bookstore at my lunch break and began the lifelong practice of buying books with information, ideas, and lessons that could help me. I dedicated my life to self-improvement, to continuous learning in every way possible. For the rest of my business life right up to the present moment, whenever I wanted or needed to learn something to help me, I have returned to learning through reading, listening to audio programs, and attending courses and seminars. I found that you could learn anything you need to learn in order to accomplish any goal you set for yourself. Over time, I learned that fully 80% of the population never accepts complete responsibility for their lives. They continually complain, criticize, make excuses, and blame other people for things in their lives about which they're not happy. The consequences of this way of thinking, however, can be disastrous. They can sabotage all hopes for success and happiness later in life. From childhood to maturity, when you are growing up from an early age, you become conditioned to see yourself as not responsible for your life. This is normal and natural. When you're a child, your parents are in charge. They make all your decisions. They decide what food you will eat, what clothes you will wear, what toys you will play with, what home you will live in, what school you'll attend, and what activities you'll engage in during your spare time. Because you are young, innocent, and unknowing, you do what they want you to do. You have little choice or control. As you grow up, however, you begin to make more and more of your own decisions in each of these areas. But because of your early programming, you are conditioned unconsciously to feel that someone else is still responsible for your life that there's still someone else out there who can or should take care of you. Most people grow up believing that if something goes wrong, someone else is responsible, someone else is to blame, someone else is guilty, someone else is the villain, and they are the victim. As a result, most people make more and more excuses for the things in their lives, past and present, that make them unhappy. Get over the mistakes your parents made. If your parents criticized you or got angry with you for mistakes you made when you were growing up, you began to unconsciously assume that somehow you were at fault. 
If your parents punished you physically or emotionally for doing or not doing something that pleased or displeased them, you felt inferior and inadequate. When your parents withheld their love to punish you for not doing something they demanded, you might have grown up with deep feelings of guilt, unworthiness, and undeservingness. All these negative feelings could then intersect to make you feel like a victim, like you are not responsible for yourself or your life once you became an adult. The most common feeling that we have as adults if we have been raised in a critical home environment is the feeling that I'm not good enough. Because of this feeling, we compare ourselves unfavorably to others. We think that other people who seem to be happier are more confident or better than us. We develop feelings of inferiority. This can become an emotional trap. The fatal fallacy. If we think, for any reason, that others are better than us, we unconsciously assume that we must be worse than they are. If they are worth more than we are, we assume that we must be worth less. This feeling of inadequacy or worthlessness lies at the root of most personality problems in our lives, as well as most political and social problems in our world, both nationally and internationally. To escape from these feelings of guilt and worthlessness that have been instilled in us as a result of destructive criticism in childhood, we lash out in our world, other people, and situations in any part of our life with which we are unhappy or discontented. Our first reaction is to look around and ask who's to blame. Most religions teach the concept of sin, which states that whenever something goes wrong, someone is to blame. Someone has done something bad, someone is guilty, someone must be punished. This whole idea of guilt and punishment leads to ever-increasing feelings of anger, resentment, and irresponsibility. In attitude of responsibility, our courts today are clogged with thousands of people demanding redress and payment for something that went wrong in their lives. Backed up by ambitious plaintiff lawyers, people go to court demanding compensation, even if they themselves are completely at fault for what happened, especially if they are at fault. People don't want to accept responsibility. People spill hot coffee on themselves and sue the fast food restaurant that sold them the coffee in the first place. People get drunk and drive off the road and then turn around and sue the manufacturer of the 15-year-old car they were driving. People climb up on a step ladder and lean over too far, falling to the ground. They then sue the ladder manufacturer for their injury. In each case, people are attempting to escape responsibility for their own behaviors by blaming someone else, making excuses, and then demanding compensation. Eliminating negative emotions. The common denominator of all people is the desire to be happy. In its simplest terms, happiness arises from the absence of negative emotions. Where there are no negative emotions, all that is left is positive emotions. Therefore, the elimination of negative emotions is your great business in life if you truly wish to be happy. There are dozens of negative emotions, although the most common are guilt, resentment, envy, jealousy, fear, and hostility. They all ultimately boil down to a feeling of anger directed either inward or outward. Anger is directed inwardly when you bottle it up rather than expressing it constructively to others. Anger is directed outwardly when you criticize or attack other people. Negative emotions are the major causes of psychosomatic illness. This occurs when the mind, psycho, makes the body, soma, sick. Negative emotions, especially as expressed in the form of anger, weaken your immune system and make you susceptible to colds, flu, and other diseases. Uncontrolled bursts of anger can actually bring about heart attacks, strokes, and nervous breakdowns. The Great Discovery All negative emotions, especially anger, depend for their very existence on your ability to blame someone or something else for something in your life that you're not happy about. It takes tremendous self-discipline to refrain from blaming others for our problems. It takes enormous self-control to refuse to make excuses. It takes tremendous self-discipline for you to accept complete responsibility for everything you are, everything you become, and everything that happens to you. Even if you are not directly responsible for something that happens, like Hurricane Katrina, you are responsible for your responses, for what you do and say from that moment forward. It takes tremendous self-mastery for you to take complete control of your unconscious mind and deliberately choose to think positive, constructive thoughts that enhance your life and improve the quality of your relationships and results. But the payoff of this form of positive thinking is tremendous. Blaming is easy. By following the path of least resistance, the easiest and most mindless behavior of all is for a person to lash out and blame someone else anytime anything goes wrong for any reason. People who develop the habit of automatically blaming often become angry at things, 
Blaming inanimate objects when they do not function as expected is so silly that it almost becomes a mild form of insanity. People become angry at doors that stick. They swear at tools that they're using when they themselves make a mistake. They get mad when their car doesn't start. Even if it is an inanimate object, if it doesn't work perfectly, then the thing must be to blame. People will often kick a car that they are mad at or a box that they tripped over. The antidote to negative emotions. The fastest and most dependable way to eliminate negative emotions is to immediately say, I am responsible, whenever something happens that triggers anger or a negative reaction of any kind. Quickly neutralize the feelings of negativity by saying, I am responsible. The law of substitution says that you can substitute a positive thought for a negative one. Since your mind can only hold one thought at a time, when you deliberately choose the positive thought, I am responsible, you cancel out any other thought or emotion at that moment. It is not possible to accept responsibility and remain angry at the same time. It's not possible to accept responsibility and experience negative emotions. It's not possible to accept responsibility without becoming calm, clear, positive, and focused once more. As long as you are blaming someone else for something in your life that you don't like, you will remain a mental child. You continue to see yourself as small and helpless, like a victim. You continue to lash out. However, when you begin to accept responsibility for everything that happens to you, you transform yourself into a mental adult. You will see yourself as being in charge of your own life and no longer a victim. In Alcoholics Anonymous, people who are having problems with drinking attend meetings with others going through the same situation. What they have found is that until the individual accepts responsibility for his or her problems both with alcohol and in other areas of life, no progress is possible. But after the person accepts responsibility, everything is possible. This is true with almost every difficult situation in life in which you project your unhappiness onto other people or factors outside yourself. Money and Emotions Many of our biggest problems and concerns in life had to do with money, earning it, spending it, investing it, and especially losing it. As a result, many of our negative emotions are associated with money in some way. However, the fact is that you are responsible for your financial life. You choose, you decide, you're in charge. You cannot blame your financial problems or situation on other people. You're in the driver's seat. So it is only when you accept responsibility for your income, who chose to accept the job you were working at, your bills, who spent the money that put you into debt, and your investments, who made those decisions, can you move from becoming an economic child to an economic adult. Responsibility and control. There's a direct relationship between the acceptance of responsibility and the amount of personal control you feel you have over your life. This means that the more you accept responsibility, the greater sense of control you experience. There's also a direct relationship between the amount of control you feel you have and how positive you feel. The more you feel that you have a high sense of control in the important areas of your life, the more positive and happy you are in everything you do. When you accept responsibility, you feel strong, powerful, and purposeful. Accepting responsibility eliminates the negative emotions that rob you of happiness and contentment. In every situation, the antidote to negative emotions is to say, I am responsible. Then look into the situation to find the reasons why you are responsible for what happened or for what is going on. Your intelligence is like a double-edged sword. It can cut in either direction. You can use your intelligence to rationalize, justify, and blame other people for things you're not happy about. Or you can use your intelligence to find reasons why you are responsible for what happened and then take action to solve the problem or resolve the situation. You can make excuses, or you can make progress. You choose, even if an accident has occurred, such as your car being damaged in the parking lot while you're at work. You may not be legally at fault for the accident, but you are still responsible for your responses, for how you behave as a result of what happened. Never complain, never explain. The mark of the leader, the truly superior person, is that he or she accepts complete responsibility for the situation. It's not possible to imagine a true leader who whines and complains rather than taking action when problems and difficulties arise. This sense of responsibility is the mark of a highly developed personality. You take responsibility for your life by resolving in advance that you will not become upset or angry over something that you cannot affect or change. Just as you do not become angry about the weather, you do not become angry over circumstances and situations over which you have no control. 
Furthermore, you especially do not allow yourself to be angry and unhappy in the present because of unhappy experiences or situations from the past. You say, what cannot be cured must be endured. It's amazing how many people are unhappy today because of a past event, even something that happened many years ago. Each time they think of the negative experience, they become angry or depressed once more. The good news is that at any time, you can stop thinking about, discussing, and rehashing the past. You can let it go and begin thinking instead about your goals and your unlimited future. As Helen Keller said, when you turn toward the sunshine, the shadows fall behind you. Self-mastery and self-control. Any self-discipline, self-mastery, and self-control begin with taking responsibility for your emotions. You take charge of your emotions by accepting 100% responsibility for yourself and for your responses to everything that happens to you. You refuse to make excuses, complain, criticize, or blame other people for anything. Instead, you say, I am responsible, and then you take action of some kind. The only antidote is action. The only real antidote for anger or worry is purposeful action in the direction of your goals, which is the subject of the next chapter. Before you turn to that, however, resolve today to first take complete control of your thoughts, feelings, and actions and then get so busy working on things that are important to you that you don't have time to think about or express negative emotions to or about anyone for any reason. When you exert your self-discipline and willpower in the acceptance of personal responsibility for your life, you take complete control of your thoughts and feelings. By doing so, you become a much more effective, happy, and positive person in everything you do. I used to think that setting goals was the key to being successful, but the more I think about it, the more I reflect on it, the more I realize that accepting responsibility for your life is the starting point of all great accomplishment. And it's been well said over and over again that it's not the government, it's not our parents, it's not your boss, it's not your family or your bills, it's you. One of the things I've found, and it's sometimes hard to get used to, is the fact that no one else can live your life for you. No one else can make decisions for you, and in the final analysis, no one else really cares. And without the acceptance of responsibility, nothing else is possible. Walking, talking, thinking, and acting like a fully responsible human being gives you a feeling of calmness, confidence, and self-control. Your income, your status, your security, your power will always tend to be equal to the responsibilities you take on. This is one distinct area where winners and losers part company. Winners always look upon themselves as the cause of what happens to them. Losers are always blaming someone or something else. We know that people always seek the fastest and easiest way to get the things they want, and if something goes wrong, the thing they want is to get off the hook. So, the fastest and easiest way is always to blame someone else. But when we blame someone else to that degree, we give control of the problem to that other person, and we take control away from ourselves. And we become more negative and frustrated the more we try to make other people responsible for things in our lives that we don't like. In fact, if you stop blaming other people, you'll find that most of your negative emotions will go away. If you can't blame anybody, and the way you stop blaming is to accept responsibility, losers never accept responsibility, and winners always do. When things go well for losers, they blame it on luck. When things go poorly for losers, they blame it on the system. But winners accept both the credit and the blame for everything that happens to them. Fully responsible adults always look upon themselves as self-employed. They act as if they own the place. They treat the company they work for as though it belongs to them. The worst mistake you can ever make in your life is to ever think that you work for anybody else but yourself. All peak performers in every field and industry look upon themselves as though they work for themselves. Even if somebody else signs their paycheck, they look upon themselves as being self-employed, and they treat the company as though it belonged to them. They accept full responsibility. If a paperclip falls on the floor, they pick it up. They never say, that's not my job. When they refer to their company, they say, S and R and we. This company instead of they and them and the boss and so on. Wherever you see an employee who is not totally committed to the company and to their work, you see a problem and you see a person that you should never allocate more responsibility to. When we come out of school, we sometimes make the mistake of thinking that if we are to be educated further, it is up to our employer to do it. And this is one of the worst mistakes that you can make because irrespective of whether or not your employer offers you training opportunities, you're 100% responsible for continuing to upgrade your skills.
Now, here's another area of responsibility. The winner always asks, what results are expected of me? One of the qualities of peak performers is that they are always very results oriented. They always ask themselves, why am I on the payroll? And if you're not sure why you're on the payroll, the first thing you have to do is go and sit down with your boss and ask him why. Am I on the payroll? Now, you don't have to use these words, but here's a very simple technique. Take and write out a job description of what you think you're on the payroll to do. Write out a list of all the things that you're supposed to accomplish and give it to your boss, and have your boss organize that list in order of priority, which is most important, which is second in importance, which is third in importance. And then always work on what is most important to your boss. Ask yourself, what can I, and only I, do that if done well will make a real difference to my company? If you own your own company, this question is even more important. But working for another company, this is the key to rapid advancement and promotion. And do what will make a difference. To accept responsibility for specific results and always results that will make a difference. Winners always focus on solutions. They ask, where do we go from here? What do we do from here? There's a big difference between winners and losers. Winners always look to the future, and losers always look to the past. Winners always look to what can be done, and losers always look at who's to blame. Losers focus on problems. Winners focus on solutions. Winners always look to themselves when there is a problem. Losers always look to others. So, if you want to achieve success within your work, always look to yourself whenever things don't go right. The rejection of responsibility leads to negative emotions. It leads to stress, denial, anger, frustration, and often psychosomatic illness. The negative mind actually depresses the immune system and makes the body sick. I think the refusal to accept responsibility for one's life is the primary reason for negativity and unhappiness in our society today. Many doctors are asking patients questions like this. Why did you need this illness? Why did you need this illness? Because what they're finding is that when people become sick, it's almost invariably because they need an illness to help them avoid dealing with some situation in their life. So what they do is they contract an illness, which is consistent with the severity of the situation. For instance, if you're feeling a little bit tired and overworked, you can track the cold or the flu. If you're feeling very, very harassed or frustrated in your life, you get something worse, right up to and including heart disease, strokes, and cancer. They found that many sick people, and especially very sick people, have a tendency to hold grudges for long periods of time and that forgiving others is a vital part of getting over the illness. And in my experience, if you cannot forgive offenses against you to that degree, you are held back from success. And the more grudges you have, the more bitter you are, the less forgiving you are, the more unhappy you will be all of your life. So make it a rule, as they say, never to let the sun go down in your anger. Make it a rule to forgive everybody in your life who has ever done anything that has hurt you and let it go past so that you can commit all of your energies toward accomplishing the things that you really want in life. Well, what have we learned with regard to responsibility? Number one is the acceptance of responsibility for your life is the stepping stone to peak performance. That until you accept responsibility for your life, nothing happens. Number two is the more self-responsible you feel, the more control you have and the better you like yourself, and the higher is your self-esteem. Number three, the expression of negative emotions caused by blaming others causes you to lose control and suffer diminished self-esteem. So catch yourself and stop yourself from blaming others by catching yourself and saying, I am responsible, I am responsible, I am responsible. Remember, the responsible person is solution-oriented, focused on the future rather than the past, and on what can be done versus who did what. All human beings make mistakes because we are anxious to get things done and to do things the fastest and easiest way, because often we're ignorant and we don't know everything you need to know, because often we're ambitious and we're in a hurry. And because often we are vain and our ego gets in the way. Because of these things, we make mistakes, and all human beings make mistakes. And a person who cannot accept the fact that others make mistakes is not cut out for greatness, is not cut out for leadership. The acceptance of complete responsibility for your success is the starting point of all great achievements, which is to sit down and say that anything that is going to happen to you or for you in life is up to you. But you cannot wait or hope that other people will do things for you. That you must take complete charge. Now, you will find a very interesting thing that when you accept total responsibility for your life, other people will help you, and if you don't, nobody will help you.
Even if they do, it won't do any good. So say to yourself, what is it that I want to accomplish? Where do I want to go? Where do I want to be? What do I want to have? And what do I have to do to get there? And then take full charge of the process. Make a habit of forgiving others, never carrying grudges around. Keep your mind calm, positive, and focused on your goals. Your ability to eliminate the expression of negative emotions, to keep your mind positive by not becoming angry or frustrated, is a hallmark of a successful personality and a healthy personality. And your tendency to blame others, to hold grudges, not to forgive others, is something that can cause you to fail and underachieve in life. Finally, ask yourself each day, what kind of a company would my company be if everybody in it was just like me? This is the question of the truly responsible individual, and you will be amazed at how rapidly an attitude of responsibility can accelerate your career. If you walk, talk, and act like a responsible, self-assured individual, you will begin to feel calm, confident, and positive about yourself. If you resist the expediency factor, the tendency to blame others when things go wrong, if you discipline yourself to accept full responsibility for what happens in your life, it will raise your self-esteem and make you feel much better about yourself and everything that you're doing. By practicing the self-discipline necessary to refrain from blaming anyone for anything, you will develop courage, character, and self-esteem. If you do what successful people do, you will be successful too, and all successful men and women are self-responsible. When I was 21, I was broken living in a small one-room apartment in the middle of a very cold winter, working on a construction job during the day. I usually couldn't afford to go out of my apartment in the evenings, where at least it was warm, so I had a lot of time to think. One night, as I sat there at my small kitchen table, I had a great flash of awareness that changed my life. I suddenly realized that everything that happened to me for the rest of my life was going to be up to me. No one else was ever going to help me. No one was coming to the rescue. I was thousands of miles from home, where I'd grown up, and had no intentions of going back for a long time. I saw clearly at that moment that if anything in my life were going to change, it would have to begin with me. If I didn't change, nothing else would change. I was responsible. I still remember that moment. It was like a first parachute jump. It was both scary and exhilarating. There I was, standing on the edge of life, and I decided to jump. From that moment onward, I accepted that I was in charge of my life. I knew that if I wanted things to be different, I would have to be different. Everything was up to me. Sadly enough, most people never do this. I met countless men and women in their 40s and 50s who were still grumbling and complaining about earlier unhappy experiences and still blaming their problems on other people and circumstances. The greatest enemies of success and happiness are negative emotions of all kinds. It is negative emotions that hold you down, tire you out, and take away all your joy in life. One of your most important goals, if you want to be truly happy and successful, is to free yourself from negative emotions. And fortunately, this can be done if you learn how. The negative emotions of fear, self-pity, envy, jealousy, feelings of inferiority, and ultimately anger are mostly caused by four factors. Once you identify and remove these factors from your thinking, your negative emotions stop automatically. The first of the four root causes of negative emotions is justification. You can only be negative as long as you can justify to yourself and others that you are entitled to be angry or upset for some reason. This is why angry people are continually explaining and elaborating on the reasons for their negative feelings. However, if you cannot justify your negativity, you cannot be angry. The second cause of negative emotions is rationalization. When you rationalize, you attempt to give a socially acceptable explanation for an otherwise socially unacceptable act. You rationalize to explain a way or to put a favorable light on something that you have done that you feel bad or unhappy about. You excuse your behavior or actions by creating an explanation that sounds good, even though you know that you were an active agent in whatever occurred. You often create complex ways of putting yourself in the right by explaining that your behavior was really quite acceptable, all things considered. This rationalizing keeps your negative emotions alive. Rationalization and justification always require that you make someone or something else the source or cause of your problem. You cast yourself in the role of the victim, and you make the other person or organization into the oppressor or the bad guy. The third cause of negative emotions is an overconcern or hypersensitivity to the way that others treat you. 
For some people, their entire self-image is determined by the way others speak to them, talk to them, or about them, or even look at them. They have little sense of personal value or self-worth apart from the opinions of others. And if those opinions are negative for any reason, real or imagined, the victim immediately experiences anger, embarrassment, shame, feelings of inferiority, and even depression, self-pity, and despair. This explains why psychologists say that almost everything we do is to earn the respect of others or at least to avoid losing their respect. The fourth cause of negative emotions, and the worst of all, is blaming. When I draw the negative emotions tree in my seminars, I illustrate the trunk of the tree as the propensity to blame other people for our problems. Once you cut down the trunk of the tree, all the fruits of the tree, all the other negative emotions die immediately. Just as when you jerk the plug out of the wall that lights up the Christmas lights in the tree, all the lights go out instantly. The antidote for negative emotions of all kinds is for you to accept complete responsibility for your situation. The very act of accepting responsibility short circuits and cancels out any negative emotions you may be experiencing. It's only when you free yourself from negative emotions by taking complete responsibility that you can begin to set and achieve goals in every area of your life. It's only when you are free mentally and emotionally that you can begin to channel your energies and enthusiasms in a forward direction. On the other hand, once you accept total responsibility for your life, there are no limits on what you can be, do, and have. From now on, refuse to blame anyone for anything, past, present, or future. As Eleanor Roosevelt said, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. If you make a mistake, say, I'm sorry, and get busy rectifying the situation. To keep your mind positive, refuse to criticize, complain about, or condemn other people for anything. Every time you criticize someone else, complain about something you don't like, or condemn someone else for something they have done or not done, you trigger feelings of negativity and anger within yourself, and you are the one who suffers. Your negativity doesn't affect the other person at all. Being angry with someone is allowing him or her to control your emotions and often the entire quality of your life at long distance. This is just plain silly. Remember, positive emotions of happiness, excitement, love, and enthusiasm make you feel more powerful and confident. Once you decide to accept complete responsibility for yourself, your situation, and for everything that happens to you, you can turn confidently toward your work and the affairs of your life. You become the master of your fate and the captain of your soul. In a study done in New York some years ago, Researchers found that the top 3% of people in every field had a special attitude that set them apart from average performers in their industries. It was this. They viewed themselves as self-employed throughout their careers, no matter who signed their paychecks. They saw themselves as responsible for their companies exactly as if they owned the companies personally. You should do the same. If there's anything in your life that you don't like, you are responsible. You are responsible for the consequences of your actions and your behaviors. You're where you were and what you are today because you have decided to be there. In a large sense, you are earning today exactly what you have decided to earn, no more and no less. If you're not happy with your current income, decide to earn more. Set it as a goal, make a plan, and then get busy doing what you need to do to earn what it is you want to earn. Just as the president of a corporation is responsible for the strategy and activities of that corporation, you're also responsible for the personal strategic planning of your own life and career. You are responsible for overall management strategy, setting goals, making plans, establishing measures, and performing to get results. You are responsible for achieving certain outputs, for the quality and quantity of the work that you produce, and the results you are expected to get. As president, you are responsible for marketing strategy, for self-promotion and advancement, for creating your image and packaging yourself to be able to sell yourself for the very highest price in a competitive market. You are responsible for financial strategy, for deciding how much of your services you want to sell and how much you want to earn, how rapidly you want to grow your income year by year, how much you want to save and invest, and how much you want to be worth when you retire. You're responsible for your people's strategy and your relationships, both at home and at work. One piece of advice I give my students is to choose your boss with care. Your choice of a boss is going to have a major impact on how much you earn, how fast you get ahead, and how happy you will be at your job. By the same token, your choice of a mate and friends will have as much or more to do with your success and happiness than any other decisions you make. 
Finally, as president, you are in complete charge of personal research and development, personal training and learning. It is up to you to determine the talents, skills, abilities, and core competencies you will need to earn the kind of money you want to earn in the months and years ahead. It is then your responsibility to make the investment. Take the time to learn and develop these skills. Refuse to whine and complain about things that happened in the past which cannot be changed. Instead, orient yourself toward the future and think of what you want and where you're going. Above all, think about your goals. The very act of thinking about your goals makes you positive and purposeful once more. There's a direct relationship between the amount of responsibility you accept and the amount of control you feel. The more you say, I am responsible, the more of an internal locus of control you develop within yourself, and the more powerful and confident you feel. There's also a direct relationship between responsibility and happiness. The more responsibility you accept, the happier you become. It seems that all three, responsibility, control, and happiness, go together. The more responsibility you accept, the greater amount of control you feel you have, the happier and more confident you become. When you feel positive and in control of your life, you will set bigger and more challenging goals for yourself. You will also have the drive and determination to achieve them. You will feel as though you hold your whole life in your own hands and that you can make it into whatever you decide to. The starting point of goal setting is for you to realize that you have virtually unlimited potential to be, have, or do anything you really want in life if you simply want it badly enough and are willing to work long enough and hard enough to achieve it. The second part of goal setting is for you to accept complete responsibility for your life and for everything that happens to you with no blaming and no excuses. With these two concepts clearly in mind, that you have unlimited potential on the one hand and that you are completely responsible on the other, you are now ready to move to the next step, which is to begin designing your ideal future. Now here are three things you can do immediately to put these ideas into action. First, identify your biggest problem or source of negativity in life today. In what ways are you responsible for this situation? Second of all, see yourself as the president of your own company. How would you act differently if you own 100% of the shares of your current company? And third, resolve today to stop blaming anyone else for anything and instead accept complete responsibility in every area of your life. What actions should you be taking? The starting point for learning how to make and keep more money is to thoroughly familiarize yourself with the entire subject so that you can anticipate opportunities and avoid economic reversals. An understanding of these laws and principles can give you the winning edge that enables you to move ahead further and faster than anyone around you. More than anything else, it will give you a heightened sense of coherence, allowing you to understand the major events of your world in a way that would escape you if you weren't familiar with these laws. Now, economic laws are merely expressions of human behavior. Just as we said that happiness comes from the satisfaction of needs, and true happiness arises when you reach the point where you're completely content, we know that all human beings, because of an identical psychological structure, act in certain ways under virtually all circumstances to achieve certain goals. These laws and principles apply to men and women, young and old, educated and uneducated, and they cross all lines of race, culture, and national origin. They explain many things that might otherwise seem inexplicable. The study of these categories of human action takes us deep into the realms of behavioral and cognitive psychology. They explain the price of apples at your local supermarket as well as the budget deficits of billions of dollars. These laws are so clear, so powerful, and so flexible that you can use them to more accurately interpret your world than perhaps you ever believed possible. More than anything else, people who fully grasp these simple concepts make profound changes in their thinking and behavior that lead them onto far higher levels of success and satisfaction in their work and personal lives. The first law of economics can be called the law of ambition. In its simplest terms, it says that every act you engage in is an attempt to improve your conditions in some way. Human beings are goal-driven organisms, always striving to achieve more of something, even if that something may change from minute to minute. From infancy to old age, you are ambitious. You want to improve your life or some part of it in some way. If you're earning a certain amount of money, you want to earn more. If you have a certain level of physical health, you want to be even healthier. If you have one home or apartment, you want a larger one. And if you have a larger one, you want a second one somewhere else. If you have a car, you want a larger car. 
It's normal and natural for every single person to continually strive to get more and better, faster and newer, and cheaper of everything and anything they can think of. The only limitations on human ambition are the limitations imposed either internally by the limitations you place on your own mind, or externally by the limitations imposed upon you by law and society. The real difference in levels of ambition is the difference that exists in levels of desire and belief. If you really believe that you can move from wherever you are to wherever you want to go, you will be continually compelled to take action to move yourself from your state of dissatisfaction to your state of greater satisfaction. This is the difference between learned helplessness and learned optimism. The great majority of people have pretty much the same abilities and talents as the most successful members of our society. But this majority believes that there's very little they can do to fulfill their ambitions. They feel helpless and powerless. They therefore continue to do what they're doing rather than increasing their abilities to accomplish their goals. They merely decrease their wants and desires so that they can be satisfied at a far lower level of accomplishment. The final statement on the law of ambition says that if you're completely contented, or if you feel completely helpless, you'll refrain from acting to improve your condition. The only reason that a person does not act to continually improve themselves in some way is because they've reached the state of contentment where they feel that no further improvement is either necessary or desirable, or they've reached the state of hopelessness where they don't think anything they do will make much of a difference. The danger is that sometimes these are conscious assumptions, assumptions that you've arrived at by thinking and reasoning, and sometimes these are unconscious assumptions. Conclusions that you've arrived at without even realizing that these conclusions have allowed you to go down a mental blind alley. The second law of economics is called the law of minimum effort. It says that you always seek to get the things you want with the least possible expenditure of effort because you value your time, money, mental and physical energy, and resources. You do everything possible to conserve them. You use your energy sparingly and spend it as carefully as possible to get the things you want. When we say that we are economic beings, we merely mean that we are economical in our choices. We don't spend more than we had to, to achieve a particular satisfaction. The first part of the law of minimum effort then says you cannot consciously choose a harder way to accomplish something if an easier way is available to you to accomplish the same result. You are structured psychologically in such a way that you can't force yourself to select a more difficult path to your goal if you can see an easier path. All things being equal, everyone is the same way, even animals are the same way. If you look at a pasture, you'll find that cattle always follow the easiest path to get from one part of the pasture to another, and each subsequent cow follows the same path, wearing a groove in the field, or what we call a cow path. You also have similar grooves born in your brain, habitual ways of acting which you engage in automatically and unthinkingly because you've simply accepted that this is the easiest way for you to get from one point to another. The second part of this law of minimum effort says that all human beings are inherently lazy in that they follow the path of least resistance in all things. Laziness, then, is normal, natural, and inherent in all human action. The lazy tendency in human beings has led to every great advance and breakthrough in the world of human science and technology. Every single forward advance has to be labor-saving in order to be successful. The most affluent countries and the most affluent companies are those who produce the highest quality of goods and services with the minimum possible effort or expenditure of resources. The word lazy is neither positive nor negative, it's not a value judgment. It's only as you demonstrate this quality that it takes on the value of being either good or bad. For example, if you manifest your laziness by continually seeking faster and more efficient ways to get the things you want, it's a good quality. However, if a person manifests their laziness by sitting around on a couch watching television, it's a bad quality. What is the ultimate measure of whether a quality is good or bad? Well, it's simply whether or not the practice of that quality leads to the improvement of the individual's life in the most economical way. If what you do is life enhancing and life enriching, and you're lazy in doing it, you're using this natural human quality of laziness in its highest and best sense. The third law of economics is the law of maximization. It says that you always seek to obtain the highest possible return for your expenditure of time, money, or resources. Again, this is just a simple and obvious explanation of human behavior under almost all circumstances. However, it's an extraordinarily important law to be aware of to enable you to avoid confusion in interpreting and understanding the behaviors of other people. The first part of the law of maximization says that when given a choice between more and less, all things being equal, 
you will always choose more in order to maximize your situation. The second part of this law says that the desire for more is automatic and instinctive and applies to all human desires and fulfillments. In other words, if you're selling something and one person offers you $5 and another person offers you $6, if you're behaving normally, you'll choose to accept the $6 rather than the $5. You will always choose more rather than less in order to maximize your satisfaction. The fourth law of economics is the law of time preference. This law says that because your time is your life, and you value your life, you always prefer earlier rather than later in the satisfaction of any desire. But another way, people prefer immediate gratification to delayed gratification, and they must be rewarded, sometimes substantially, to put off gratification at all. The first part of this law is that when given the choice between a reward today or the identical reward at some future time, in the absence of extenuating circumstances, you'll prefer to take the reward now rather than later. If someone says to you, I'll give you a thousand dollars today or I'll give you a thousand dollars in six months, all things being equal, when would you prefer to have the thousand dollars? The answer is obvious. If you have the choice, you'll take it now rather than later, because it's worth more now. Because of the law of time preference, you need to be rewarded for delaying gratification. You need to be compensated in some way to a greater degree in the future if you're willing to put off enjoying the reward today. For example, interest rates are merely rewards for delaying the expenditure of money today into some future period. If you could spend a dollar today or spend a dollar in one year, in order for you to wait for one year, you will want to be rewarded with even greater spending power, or the power to buy yourself the satisfactions you desire a year from today. All interest rates are merely rewards for waiting. Over all of recorded economic history, the average interest rate required for a person to wait is about 3 to 4 percent per year. But when interest rates are higher than 3 percent, the extra amount reflects the inflation that might take place, the taxes that might be taken off the interest payment, and the degree of risk involved in getting your money back at all. If any one of those three factors is higher than one of them, the interest that you require to delay gratification from the present to the future will be higher still. This is why, in some countries with high inflation rates, it's quite common for them to offer interest rates of 20%, 30%, even 40% per month. These are merely rewards for delaying gratification and are based on the law of time preference. The second part of this law simply says that you are inherently impatient in the achievement of your goals, and this tendency toward impatience is neither good nor bad. Because you value your life, you value your time, and the various pleasures and gratifications there are for you to enjoy with that time, you are always more eager to enjoy these satisfactions now as opposed to waiting. It takes self-mastery, self-control, and self-discipline to restrain your appetites and delay gratification to a later period, because it may be much better and more rewarding to do so. The fifth law of economics is the law of vanity. As applied to economics, it says that you are egotistical and self-centered, placing a high value on your appearance, opinions, choices, relationships, and the way you're treated by others. This law says that each person is ego-centered and vain, extremely concerned about how they are perceived by others, and much of your personality is determined by the way you think others see you and think about you. The fact of vanity and the role of the ego in human behavior is not even open to question. The entire fashion industry, automotive industry, jewelry industry, furniture industry, clothing industry, in many other industries are all built around appealing to the individual's desire to look good to others. Perhaps the greatest single threat to freedom and opportunity for you and me is the unrestricted growth of government taxation and government regulation. The reason all of these attempts, albeit noble and praiseworthy, fail is because they must be carried out by normal human beings with normal human drives and motivations. 